Munial webinar four. This is the fourth in the series of webinars being conducted by Munial Institute of Ayurveda Medical Sciences, Manipal. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for patronizing us. As we promised earlier, today we are coming with a very interesting topic related to the pharmaceuticals. This is not just relevant to pharmaceutical people, very important for students, clinicians, teachers, and researchers also. Because we know that Bheshajam Namatat Yat Upakarana Yopakalpate Bheshaja Thatu Samya Nirvritto Prayatamanasya. The quality of medicine greatly decides the process of the treatment. Today we have Dr. T.S. Murali Dharan, Chief Technical Services from Ayurveda Shala Kottakal. I should thank him very much for sparing his time and joining us. Thank you so much, sir. Welcome you. And we have Dr. Divya P, who is the moderator of this session also. She will be taking up second session. And without much delay, I transfer my responsibility to Dr. Divya as a moderator. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, it's a privilege for me to introduce my here uh, as our guest. Uh, he was a senior, like he was a scientist for 23 years with Baba Atomic Research Center. And for the past 26 years, sir is working with Ariyavaiti Shaila Kotekil in the research and development section. And he has done many major research activities in collaboration with IIT Kharagpur, Baba Atomic Research Center and Manipal Academy, Banaras Hindi University, etc. So it's, a, it's our privilege to have sir for today's webinar session and we are extremely happy to welcome you sir for this session. Now I'll hand over the responsibility to sir, I'll shift to sir. Uh, is it time for me to start Dr. Divya? Yes, yes, yes. sir, please sir. Uh -huh. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Div uh, Dr. Divya, Dr. Satyanarayan, and all the colleagues over there. I consider it a personal privilege that you have offered me this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, yeah. uh, Madam, I have a small uh, PP, a PowerPoint presentation. I would rather show that to you. Along with that, I would be speaking as well. And uh, welcome to all those audience and uh, who are there on the uh, connectivity, web connectivity now. Welcome to all of you. Uh, I have been asked by Dr. Divya to talk uh, briefly about uh, the Ayurvedic pharmaceutical sector in general. And uh, I should concede at the very beginning that, uh, as I said, it's an overview. And an overview normally suffers from lack of specificity. Uh, it will be general, more, more in general terms. Maybe if we get an opportunity, we will go into details later, number one. Number two, I am also told that what we have at our disposal is 40 minutes. And she has advised me that I should uh, restrict myself to about 30 minutes and leaving about 10 to 15 minutes for any possible discussion. So I have tried to remove all the frills. I have tried to remove all the frills and uh, other uh, details. I will rather focus on the, the essentiality, so to say. So I will start with the uh, presentation. Uh, I will. Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, am I audible to you? Uh, it doesn't matter. It's okay. Don't worry. Yes, yes, sir. You are audible. You are audible, sir. Uh, as I said, it is an overview on the Ayurvedic pharmaceutical sector. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Yes. Uh, what I think, uh, what time is it now? I must try to keep up to time. My God, it's already 50, uh, 3.9. Okay. Uh, the scope of the presentation will be uh, the industrial nature of the sector, the drug sector, the need for regulation and its history, the role of standardization, the governmental initiative, and certain examples I will try to present before you, and also the scope and challenges. This is what, in short, I will try to present you in the next half an hour. 
and uh, uh, we all know that unlike what has been originally conceived and envisaged by the ayurvedic shastric text presently at least the drug sector has turned into an industrial activity it is to be noted that there is a paradigm shift resulting from relocating ayurveda in an industrial scenario now what is implication what is the paradigm uh, shift there is uh, uh, any seminar webinar okay uh, i would like to present uh, refer to two specific examples for this paradigm shift number one is the batch size these are all the, the, the essentialities of an industry ayurveda classics mostly envisage tailor made preparations in single dose batches all of us know that but in the industrial scenario uh, the mod would obviously prefer scaled up bulk level production of universalized medicine there are two three different aspects number one is universalized medicines they are no more tailor made specific individual based formulations whereas they are all whatever is available in the market one goes and gets according to a and also the preparation is not in the home background single dose small batch but then huge volume scale the preparation based on technology other kind so this is one paradigm shift yet another one is from the user point of view there is a important factor which we call as user compliance the classics do not pay much attention to user compliance of drugs in terms of their taste or dose factor or packing etc whereas they are all very relevant these days the modern society is very sensitive to such aspects and the industry tries to respond to them as a necessary consequence they try to respond to them all these things sort of, uh, reflect in finally what it is going to be and in the industrial scenario there are a few factors you know uh, uh, which decide the industrial character one of them is its size uh, i will just refer to the fact that in india the modern pharma sector is about 200000 crore rupees that is 2 lakhs crore rupees this is not to do with ayurveda this is the pharma all of you know particularly in this covid scenario 40% of the generic drugs that the us citizen takes is given by india that is our position in that whereas the whole herbal sector including all variants in ayurveda whatever you see on the television promotion it's about only 12000 crore it's about 6% this is all our size we are not such a big size compared to modern pharma now the ayurveda industry uh, is it's very heterogeneous in the sense that there are various diverse aspects it is diverse in its form in its function and also in its reach hence a normalized approach to may not suffice because each particular segment each particular character will need its own approach naturally the approach and extent of standardization will be diverse for each category you can't have a common uh, universalized kind of an approach in this case because each one the, i will just cite a few examples of this diversity for example on the conceptual basis itself there are diversities because uh, unlike what the common people think ayurveda is not a monolith kind of thing in the country they are very diverse in each aspect and uh, the, the few examples are the size of operation as mentioned earlier the financial outlay the product range product type and the market reach in all these things the ayurveda drug manufacturing sector of the country is very very diverse there are very different kinds of components to that now i will set example on the basis of the turnover for example there are a few mega institutions which are say annually 500 crore or more there are large size ones which are 100 crore and more medium 10 crores small tiny micro and it is reported that there are about more than 9500 individual drug manufacturing units in ayurveda across the country but more than 90% i would even go up to 95% are medium small tiny and micro there are only very few in the mega because that is the sector that is the character of the sector now yet another aspect of the diversity is the product diversity for example there are those institutions which specialize in exclusively classical formulations both schedule 1 and pnp i will refer to what they are for most of you must be knowing that and then 
there are also both classical as well as modern forms some of the components are of that kind then there are those exclusive ones which deal only in modern formulations both in composition and in galenic form it is a very formulation is modern from their point of view that I, i will cite few examples for example if i may even mention leaf 52 or many other companies they base their activity on ayurvedic knowledge but their procedures processes and products are all modern in that sense and there are modern take offs from ayurveda there are dietary supplements because they know that the ayurveda textbooks say that this is a particular thing tulsiya or brand whatever it is and they take a cue from that and then apply modern pharmacological methodology and come out with a modern drug and there is a totally otc segment over the counter just go and buy across the counter very many things like cosmetics dietary supplements health supplements extracts all of them are the, the different kinds all of them are put together in a single basket and we call the ayurveda or herbal but then each one of these specific categories have their own features and attributes now i would be focusing more on the classical segment because that is the drugs per se the classical segment is the one which has classical formulations and perhaps their analogs as well there are there are variants from that that is where pnp comes they rely mostly on prescription channels these uh, these medicaments move channels through prescriptions and both okay so just to cite an example uh, in the case of an ayurvedic industry about as i said about 45 to 50% of the cost goes to material this is a very unique situation because it is so much material intensive kind of an industry i will cite a few examples for example uh, 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 an organization like avils who, who have about 550 different kinds of formulations the turnover is 500 crores then we use about uh, uh, 7.4 lakh liters of ginger oil in a year 5.7 lakh liters of coconut oil honey ghee milk gold 35 kilograms silver saffron saffron comes all the way from kashmir and 505 kilograms is what we got last year gorojanam for example i am only citing this as an example to show that no uh, you must also be aware that we use about 650 to 75 different kinds of raw materials for manufacturing about 550 different medicaments formulations which are both schedule 1 and few are pnp pnp means proprietary and patented so this is the, the, the kind of uh, size that the industry is talking about talking about anji hello okay now this is some if you kurundoti sida that is bella uh, that's about 1.6 kilograms in a year pepper 21000 pippali 71000 jaggery cardamom amkura means ashwagandha 62000 kilograms this is the kind of thing and there are similar that uh, there are a typical example of uh, raw material that one has and the extent of the quantum ginger uh, oil as i said 7.4 lakhs of liters oil honey etc etc gold 35 kilograms in a year the, it is so very that is okay uh, now th- that's what i was trying to illustrate by this display saying that there are diverse items huge quantities and uh, this is only a typical example we use about 650 different kinds of raw materials of this kind uh, okay now Uh, just to say yet another few example bella uh, 1.6 lakh kilograms per year pepper 21000 tipali jaggery cardamom uh, ashwagandha uh, and similar others i only wanted to show as a typical example the, 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 the diversity and the huge volume that an industry needs to use for manufacturing this kind of medicaments unlike many other industries that's why now and naturally an ayurvedic industry the knowledge of ayurveda is the basic principle it is the foundation but at the same time that is not alone it is depending on kinds of industrial uh, tools personal management uh, materials management engineering finance and management costing all these things also play crucial roles this is typical example where do we have industrial application in raw material management 
drug processing, product quality assurance, drug presentation, drug development, research and innovation. These are the areas where modern technology definitely can play a very important role and it does indeed play now in the present stage. Now, uh, and all these areas have a necessary component of standardization. The moment the engineering tools come into play, there is an amount of standardization that's also an integral part. Unlike the traditional and conventional methods of Ayurvedic practice, the present industrialized mode is more amenable to methods of standardization. What I try, I, what I want to try, uh, tell is that there is more and more, uh, more and more application of objective, quantifiable, precise, and accurate methods and means and modes and tools compared to largely subjective approaches, largely subjective parameters that, that, that were the deciding factor, factors of Ayurveda in earlier times. Now, the thrust areas are electromechanical means of drug processing. I will just rush through a few examples to illustrate this point. And Ayurvedic drug manufacture is essentially a chemical engineering method or a process engineering procedure. And equipmental methods of quality control and computer-based data analysis, which we call as ERP. All these are technology inputs into a classical activity like Ayurvedic drug manufacture. Now, some examples are listed in the next few projections. I will just rush through. I don't know whether how far I have crossed the time out of this uh, uh, 40 minutes. Uh, some examples are, uh, for example, this is steam. There was a time when we were totally dependent, the industry was totally dependent on uh, uh, this thing, wood as a source of energy for boiling purposes. And Ayurveda is a boil, boiling basis, uh, is the fundamental basis of drug processing. And fossil fuel was the thing which we cannot use anymore. This is a typical example of about eight tons per hour steam generating capacity. The steam is distributed all across the manufacturing unit where this is the source of heat, this is the source of boiling that is happening. There are about total of 20, 20 tons per hour installed capacity over here. But I just want to show an example. Now, once that gets passed through the industry, through pipes, it goes to stainless steel vessels, which contains 10,000 liters or 8,000 liters of the liquid fluid, water, and other things. And there will be either double walled vessel and uh, the, the steam is what provides the temperature to the skin of the vessel and boiling happens. And uh, one advantage of using steam compared to any other source of heat, like say for a few, for say a few hours or uh, thermic fluid or many other things, uh, pressure cooking is that here there is a cutoff of 100 degrees Celsius. You can always maintain that. And the classical Ayurveda always says, we really do not know what the, what the Ajaryas had in their mind, but we know that they were also boiling water and the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius then and even now. So you take it to see the processing temperature were never temperature never goes beyond 100 degrees Celsius. This is the basic principle of applying technology. You can use modern technology, technological tools and methods, but ensure that we are maintaining the classical dictum, what they have in their mind. This is not very easy, but then this is one guideline that whenever you are, try to apply in technology, this is the deciding factor. Any, many people ask us, why don't you use pressure cooking for uh, pro processing like what we do at home? But the difference is that in a pressure cooker at home, what we use at the end is the rice, not the liquid part of it. Whereas in this case, we try to boil certain quantities, prescribed quantities of raw materials in water, boil it and throw that vegetable debris out and take whatever molecules have been transferred to water at the temperature of boiling. This is what happened. Now, when there is a, a, a pressure, physics tells you that uh, the moment there is a pressure, the boiling point rises beyond 100 degrees Celsius in the case of water. If you go to the Himalayas, top of Himalayas, tea starts boiling at a lower temperature because there is a lower pressure over there. And we are not sure about the fidelity of the molecules, bioactive molecules of the raw materials, when the temperature goes beyond a certain limit. What is the limit? We do not know. But we know that the Ajarias were also boiling water. So 100 degrees Celsius is acceptable to us. This is the basic principle. And all these vessels are, this is a double wall vessel. Across that you will find uh, central coil drug boilers. Uh, each one of them has uh, 
Water as the medium and raw material being boiled in that. There are certain, as you know, there are principles. This sort of grinding that is happening, any number of them. These are only 5 to 10 liters. There are up to 40 liter capacity with grinders for making pills and all that. This is what is used for Sandhanam, Asavarishta Sandhanam, fermentation tanks. And here again, Temperature is a factor because the fermentation is an exothermic uh, activity. The temperature will go rise up to about 40, 42 degrees Celsius. It can go up. When it goes beyond that, it actually is an hindrance for further fermentation. And fermentation always com gets completed in a matter of 10 to 12 days. It starts from the second or third day and then goes up to about 8, 9%, then it reaches a plateau. But then this remains in the tank for another 20 days, a total 30, 31 days is what is required. And each day you need to take a sample out and send to the laboratory and get it tested for the temperature, the pH value, the alcohol content, reducing sugar, et cetera, et cetera, because the sugar content gets converted to the alcohol in this. This is, this is the Santhanam Aristas class. Now this is an Avaleham plant you know, where the raw materials are lifted from the, the, the basement through an IoT crane transfer to the thing and finally the processes get comes down partly by gravity then through pump then uh, the, the, the tandumat test is done and then goes to further mixing with the prakshapaka churna. This is a typical, this, this is a general engineering technology that's what I wanted to show. Uh, the free meeting will end in 10 minutes it says madam, I don't know. Mm. Um, now this is a pulverizing where there are churnas are made then these are our tray dryers what we call there's a steam in those tubes carry steam and uh, the, the, the transfer through the uh, chambers and the drug whatever you want to uh, dry are fed through stainless steel trays and the, the, the drying takes place there these are these are the typical trays of drying drying trays and this is a very interesting this is a vacuum tray dryer the, the, as I said, you know, temperature is a matter of sensitive. Many of our materials are temperature sensitive. They cannot go beyond uh, heating, uh, boiling certain times. You can, cannot have punataptam vesham, you say. All these kinds of issues are there. So, this is a chamber where the pressure can be reduced a little. And so that the boiling happens at a lower temperature at about 70 degrees, 65 degrees. So the fidelity maintains. And this is the chamber in which we made Amaligata Sainam for our collaboration with the Manipal Academy, BARC, Lucknow, and all that. The Amaligata Sainam, it's not a commercial product of ours for our research, but we still continue to make it for uh, Dr. Satyamurthy of Manipal Academy, as well as Professor Lakotia of Benares in the University, for many others. So this is a typical chamber where boiling is done at a lower temperature under vacuum. Now, this is what is known as a fluidase bed processing. This is the, uh, located in our Nanjongot factory near Mysore, where what happens, you know, when you have to make a granule, it has to pass through various stages of cooking, concentrating, drying, granulating, pulverizing, all kinds of things. All of those activities happen in this particular equipment where there is an adiabatic pressure that is generated due to a vacuum related downfall of the material and the, 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 the coating of the kashayam, whatever it happens on the embryo while passing it through this chamber and you get finally uniform size granules of the drug and which goes for tabulating subsequently. It is a fairly expensive equipment, but mostly modern medicine people use it. We took some several trials and started using for our own purpose. These are all mixers, granulate, conventional um, drug manufacturing equipments. And these are a mass mixer and homogenizer. Uh, I, I don't want to go to detail, so I only wanted to show that yes, Ayurvedic drug manufacturing also involves technology, pharmaceutical technology. But there are issues with respect to that. that I, don't, I don't know whether I have enough time to talk about that. This is the gel processing equipment. These are tablet compressors. Tableting is one area where I would like to talk to you about because conversion of some of the very bitter tasting liquid kashayas, vathas in the form of solid tablets was a, an important step as far as we are concerned for improving and for enhancing the user compliance of uh, classical medicaments. Ultimately, this is expected to uh, enhance the acceptability of the classical medicaments. Uh, encapsulation, for example, basmas are highly uh, fine dust kind of a material, dhuli, what they say. And you know, delivery of the correct dose was always a concern because uh, either at the stage of uh, uh, dispensing or packing 150 milligram, 100 milligram, it used to be uh, got dispersed in 
open air when there is a ceiling fan open and the dose delivery was an issue that made us think about it where you fill uh, a basma in a capsule of appropriate size have a filler without filler it's not possible you have to necessarily have a filler but more importantly when you have a filler you have to have uniform blending otherwise you don't get the dose at all that extreme machine is a double cone blender where this uh, uniform mixing happens this is blister packing because finally when you deliver it to the user it should be in a manner that each dose he exposes not the if you have the tablets in a uh, container when you take one in a monsoon period the relative humidity is so very high the rest of the tablets are also likely to be impacted by the moisture but in this kind of a situation it doesn't happen that is why a blister packing these are oil liquid fillings are very common equipment pouch packing because there's a three ply either alu aluminium or pvc foil where 10 grams of the churnas are packed in this kind of so these are the uh, technology examples there are a few others i don't want to go into too many of details this is an important data which i think the practicing doctor should that's know that's Haji? hello okay uh, did you say uh, anything did uh, is it time for me to stop anyway um, uh, statutory regulations is something which uh, uh, everybody should be aware of and uh, uh, for everything that is for achieving this standardization the government has stipulated session procedures you can have developed your own in-house practices and modern science always comes to your help that is what i want to say for example and there is a history the government intervention by way of regulations this again it's better to know the pharmacopoeia pharmacopoeia committee for the country came into being in 1962 under the chairmanship of professor namjoshi in maharashtra that was in 1962 and the practice of ayurveda was brought under the domain of the drugs and cosmetic act of india in 1962 until then it was a free for all kind of a situation but it was only a beginning because it's still an ongoing activity it's evolving in fact and the first volume of ayurvedic formulary came out in 1978 by the government and pharmaceutical standard these are all only tentative things in 1980 and for the first time a department a minuscule department of ism was established in 1994 in a very small one with one or two couple of people during mr narasimha rao's prime ministership and uh, it still took years another 20 30 years for us to have an independent department and the ayurvedic pharmacopoeia started coming in 1995 there are two volumes dealing with the raw materials as well as finished products and the schedule t and gmp came into being in 2002 until then gmp was not there the provision in drugs and cosmetic act which covers gmp is schedule t and heavy metal regulation came in 200 and 2006 which most of you must be knowing about the samples paper the jama paper about uh, heavy metal being present in market uh, samples of ayurvedic medicine uh, government hello uh, and 2000, uh, 2002 and and 2006 and drugs and cosmetic act adds new p and p entities including extract this was a great thing because some of us the conventional is always believe that ayurvedic medicaments are prepared in water water extract echo extract now they have brought in a provision where they say that hydro alcoholic extracts could also be used there are certain advantages but there are certain uncertainties as well and uh, they even indicate that the possibility of using other solvents like xylene benzene on kind of something with further regulation that's all and the gcp good clinical practices and good laboratory practices came into not clp to glp uh, rules came into being in 2012 and ayurvedic pharmacopoeia commission came into being in 2012 and separate ministry in 2015 and you must have read uh, in yesterday's newspaper saying that the government has brought all the the, the ghaziabad the laboratory pulling what we call pharmacopoeia laboratory for indigenous medicine and the homeopathy is all put together under the ministry of ayush now now they have come into being as a single entity under full control of the ministry of ayush it happened just yesterday the government of india okay there is a message for me okay and uh, this is what uh, the, the, the government regulation step by step it happened and, and it, in 2015 
the government constituted a separate ministry. Now we have sort of, you know, we have an IOS minister, IOS department. It's a full-fledged activity now. And not only that, it's a matter of uh, great satisfaction to see that during this uh, pandemic period, official people also start talk in terms of potential use of Ayurvedic medicaments, at least as immunity booster. For example, Ayush Vath Churn is already in the market, I suppose, with instruction of the Department of Ayush. Similarly, sanitizers with the Ayush ingredients, based of course on isopropyl alcohol or ethyl alcohol, but they're all there, you know. We have been partly taken into the straight, which was not the case until very recent past. Okay. Now, the rules which pertain to us are, to us means the industry. And, 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 and the industry means, there is one thing that I want to tell you, the practitioners, I don't have much time, but I want to tell you is that there was a time when the Ayurvedic practitioners could practice their knowledge, their skill on their own. The physician could just go and prepare and cook his own formulations and give to their patients, dispense to their patients. That is no more the case. Unless Ayurvedic medicines are available readily in the market in a usable manner, the physicians cannot practice their knowledge because they don't have the wherewithal to prepare medicine. The patients don't want to use it unless it is properly packed and presented. And the regulations are so very strict. So industry is very important. If the industry is not there, I'm telling you, the very practice of Ayurveda is under threat. So, Rex and Cosmetic Act is the regulation 1940. Then, what I was trying to tell that these are the rules which uh, cover the drug activity in Ayurveda. Schedule Good manufacturing practice is an important thing. It's essential. When you get a uh, license, this also comes along. You have to get a. Uh, uh, just a second. What was that message? Uh, okay, please continue. Yeah, sure. And, and uh, every manufacturer gets is a license from the state drug controlling authority. But the drug controlling authorities under the administrative control of the state government. But the regulations covering their operations are covered by the Drugs and Cosmetic Act. If the Senate. OK. And um, the major domains of DMP impact are on right from the, the, the receipt of raw materials, then raw material storage, in-process control, batch manufacturing record that is BMR, it's a very crucial document. Finished product quality check, finished product storage and dispatch, and product complaint record. All these areas are covered under the GMP regulations. And um, the, there are a few legal documents which also are pertaining to quality control. Ayurvedic formulary of India, there are four volumes. This is not what I originally mentioned. It started only 10, 15 years ago. They it's a continuous activity. New volumes are coming, which standardizes the, the, the formulation. Typically, for example, uh, until recently, the formulary did not have the kind of kashayas that are familiar to the southern India. Karnataka also, I suppose, kashayam, what we call. North Indian practice is conversant only with kwatha churna. Now, they have started including the kashayam, the pravahi kashaya, sruta kashaya, what they call. And even the tabulated version, we have given the original monographs for a set of six formulations for that purpose. But it took quite some time. But otherwise, it was not an official, that, that, that what it was it didn't cover. Now, Ayurvedic Pharmacopoeia of India part one, there are nine volumes which deals with the raw material, the herbs. I think Dr. Divya will be dealing. I know that she is going to talk about that. And Ayurvedic Pharmacopy of India Part 2, there are three volumes, third or fourth volume have just come online, I suppose. And they deal with formulations and their standards and their SOP, standard operating procedures. And protocol for testing of Ayush medicines is a publication with the Department of Ayush. And, and Indian Pharmacopy of Ayurveda, Pharmacopy Pharma, 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 Pharma of Ayurveda is also in the coming. Now, why this kind of control? Always we confront this question. We have been having a free time. Why this is being controlled by the government? That is the question. The answer is that there was a time when there was a personal relationship between the patient and the, his uh, doctor, the physician. The, the onus of responsibility of maintaining the quality and the standard of the drug relied on the physician. And that was decided by his principles of ethics and his relationship with the patient. That is no more the condition. Presently, the manufacturer, the retailer, the prescribing physician, and the patient are four entirely four different entities. And the relationship between them are only commercial. 
No, that being situation, there is a need for uh, ensuring that the right uh, standard is maintained, the right quality is made, sustained, and that role is to be taken by the government. That is why all these regulations have come into place. Now, the standardization step, there are three aspects mostly at the materials level, at the processing level, and also at the finished product level. Now, raw materials, I will not talk at all anything because Dr. V is an expert, I am not expert at all. Ayurveda talks about certain quality attributes of the ingredients. They are mostly organoleptic, the kind of parameter which are understood by the five sensory organs based on subjective assessment. But then our classic Adarias had a special knack of making object, bringing out objectivity out of subjective pressure. That's a different thing, which, which may not be there anymore now. And then the modern science helps in establishing objective quality parameters based on botany and phytochemistry. And there are other attributes as well. Okay, now standards of the raw materials, the Ayurvedic Pharmacopoeia Committee under the Ministry of Ayush has brought out nine volumes, as I mentioned earlier, under the Ayurvedic Pharmacopoeia of India Part 1, which contain the scientific monographs giving quality and standard parameters about 570 ingredients. I will not say anything more than about that. What all I want to give some three examples of, added to that, what possibly a modern scientific input can help in that system. And even your college, any college should be possible to do that. This is a typical example, for example, saffron. Saffron is one item where there is extensive alteration. You won't believe it, the kind of thing comes from India. It comes essentially from Kashmir, but there are other things from Spain, from Iran, that kind of things. But you are expected to use only the Kashmir variety. And we find that, and we follow the what is known as the BAS standard, diphenylamine test, and certain other tests are that floral waste, etc. With all that, we have seen that the diflorum interest is an orange kind of a color. There are people who have contaminated with uh, potassium dichromate, you know, just to mislead us. Now, this is a, it has three specific molecules which uh, decides its pungency, its color, and its fragrance. That is crossin, microcrossin, and saffronalin. And uh, by using a spectrophotometer in the uh, ultraviolet visual uh, visible range, we have been able to identify, specify the wavelengths of each one of them. And this can be used as a parameter. Apart from our uh, um, BA, BAS standard, this is an in-house standard. I just want to cite this as an example where modern science can come to our help. This is yet another example. Trivrati, no, I, I won't know the botanical name of Trivrati, Tarpatiam, or whatever it is. Now, uh, there have been issues that then there are three specific molecules, as you can see in the lower curve, the peaks are there. One of them is uh, uh, scopolitin, yes, yeah, scopolitin, apart from uh, Darpita and all that. Any one of them you can use as a standard marker. Take it on a uh, HPTLC profile, but then for doing that, you will have to first decide on the first uh, so the forming kind of an organic solvent, then developing solution, the mobile phase, all those things you have to do. That that is where your skill remain. Once you do that, this is, becomes a very useful tool in, in ensuring that batch to batch there is a certain amount of fidelity. This uh, and this is yet another equipment which we have been using in our laboratory. The, what we call is it a herbus. It's not a standard equipment. This herb authentication system. This was developed by CSIR, uh, which input from us. What we did was that the, 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 the microscopic sectional picture of botanical samples are taken into the memory of the uh, system of the software. And whenever a sample comes, you take a similar cross-sectional view and compare with that. But then it's true that even there, the skill of a, a capable expert botanist, taxonomist will be required. But at the same time, this is a very useful tool. We have the, our uh, Center for Medicinal Plants Research has used this equipment extensively for generating libraries of uh, uh, the standards. The adulteration can easily be removed. This was based on an experience I had in my earlier uh, uh, institution that is atomic energy, but this was used for this kind of an application. This is the ultimate picture. The left one is original, the, uh, the uh, adult one, the right one is original. This, this is a typical output, whether X or Y. I just want to show how it will finally be seen. 
that is as well as the raw material so i am not i have not gone into the the, the other normal uh, aspects of raw material standards i only said the possibilities now in the case of in process standards when i was telling about uh, bmr batch manufacturing record this is an essential component for the drug controller to check for every batch it should be called back whenever it is required to trace and track and find out what happened what it essentially for each formulation this kind of a picture is generated you can't see it in very closely it doesn't need you don't need to have so what it essentially shows is that it shows two input ways the raw materials come from where including steam water etc the material to whatever process they go what kind of processing is it washing or filtering or grinding or boiling or whatever it is each one there is a output coming out of that it may be a waste in the form of a steam or it may be a waste in the form of a solid debris or it may be a useful item in the form of water each one goes through a different line ultimately the finished product comes and goes out to the packing whether the waste material whether it is solid waste or uh, liquid based or steam they go to it through that. but then this should be accounted properly that that is that is what this kind of a figure a flow chart will help us to do for every formulation such a for flow chart will be very useful now in the case of products uh, we know that classical ayurveda is quite conversant about quality they were very concerned also the classical text to provide certain parameters of standard for the prepared formulation avale hade call it tantumat the threading when the whether the processing has come to the right position vaadi taritum in the case of asma it will float on water rekha puridatam when you put it on your finger it will fill the the line agnikshita that is in the case of sneham lipids you know it will uh, Circle when you put it on when you put it on a big and show to the flame. These are all typical examples, but we also have modern methods. You know, the government has brought out two series of books, as I said earlier. The Ayurvedic Formulary of India, four volumes have come out. The Ayurvedic Pharmacopoeia, SOPs and standards are there. Not only the standards, it also specifies the tech analytical methods for arriving at the standards. Yes. now a typical example is that ingredients quantities method of preparation that is sop standard operating procedure then it also asks for a tlc profile a tlc profile does not really tell you what specific molecules are there in a formula does not even say how much each one of them there but it gives you a profile that, that itself is a major step forward if you know the profile from batch to batch if there is going to be any variation it will be easy for us to find out yes this is something drastically different from the earlier one you can have a standard of each one of them that is the point of having a tlc profile and then physical chemical parameters are too many refractive index specific gravity saponification value iodine value acid and these are all there in the thing i don't have to go to the details and then the contamination part of it therapeutic use dose these these are these are the parameters which finally comprise a product standard now examples of application i will just cite a few examples also yeah, when where modern scientific methods modern scientific tools can be found useful uh, this is only a laboratory doesn't matter this is an sptl equipment i am sure you are all conversant with this equipment a chromatograph is an equipment which actually breaks up the individual compounds or molecules of an organic system that is what it does nothing uh, there are different kinds of gas chromatography there liquid chromatography there this is something called based on paper thin layer chromatograph but it is a high performance thin layer chromatograph this is what is the anchrom equipment it is a very very useful equipment in the case of ayurvedic industry for both quality control as well as for developmental activity i will cite just three examples this is a typical example for example tripulaji churan or any other churan for example now you can see a certain kind of a trend of a, this is a profile each peak represents a particular molecule we do not know which particular molecule they are but then they represent a molecule the point is that 1 2 3 4 5 there are five graphs here representing five different batches so if each batch has the same profile you can feel sure that you have not tampered with the quality and the standard of the formulation that's what it does this is yet another application for example as i said earlier kashayams the pravahi kashayam the sridha kashayam they were not included 
uh, in the Ayurvedic formulary of India. We, that was, we did something back. We showed this data to them. Then this is about uh, Kataka Khadiradi Kashayam, is a typical uh, Kashaya anti diabetic, I suppose, whatever it is. Uh, these are the representative peaks for about several peaks, several batches. What we did was that we kept some couple of sealed bottles of the same batch. And we started opening it over a period of time, six months, one year, one and a half years, two years, and we started profiling. And we, what we found was that, uh, you will see in the front side, front ones, the height of the peak started slowly coming down after two and a half, three years. After three years, without opening, they were all sealed bottles. What it shows is that an organic material matter, kashaya is based on uh, vegetable uh, material, they have a shelf life. Even without being exposed to atmospheric air, by just keeping in a sealed condition over the period of time, after about three years, it starts reducing its chemical activity, its bioactivity. This is the data we presented to just uh, the Irish department said that we need to have a stability factor, a shelf life has to be decided based on this kind of information. This is yet another example of application of HPTLC. When we started converting our kashayams, bitter tasting liquid kashayams into the form of solid tablets, we wanted to make sure, and also we want to tell the regulators, the policy makers, the public at large, that we are not doing any tampering to the essential formality. So this is uh, two curves representing the HPTLC profile of Maharasnadi kashayam in the liquid form as well as in the solid form. And you will see that pink curve, which is in the front, it has an additional peak, a big one on the right side. That actually is due to the presence of a preservative. We use a preservative in liquid kashayam. But that preservative is not used in the solid tablet because it doesn't require that. If the moisture content is less than 5%, it has no problem at all. And I said that earlier, if it is packed in a blister packing, you know, when you take two tablets, the other tablets are not exposed to atmospheric air. So this peak, represent that uh, uh, preservative, the other way the peak there is a genuinity. So this is an exercise that we normally do when we attempt any change in the dosage presentation form. And this again, all of you must be knowing the great heavy metal issue that happened in 2004 when uh, Sapra published his paper in JAMA and uh, it became in the form of a regulation that every Ayurvedic formulation when it is being exported and doing that, it should make sure that the presence of four heavy metals, mercury, cadmium, arsenic and lead, they have specific values. Each country has light variation. In our case, I think lead is 10, mercury is 1, arsenic is 3, and cadmium is 0.3 ppm, I suppose. And this is an equipment called Atomic Absorption Spectrophotometer. It detects the presence of even that level, even PPP level of this kind of heavy metals, if it is there in that material. It's a very cumbersome practice. First, you have to have a digestion system by using picrochloric acid, very strong acid, and take it in the form of liquid, aspirate that liquid into this equipment. And depending upon the particular metal, there is a unique wavelength which will be detected to tell that this particular metal is present or it is not present. This is a very useful equipment. This is a standard equipment for testing heavy metals. We have been using this for the last couple of, uh, 10 years or so. For a very batch, this has to be there as an accompanying statement. And uh, I must tell you, we have seen earlier in some cases, you know, something like pepper, rudra, etc. You know, on the surface, there are likelihood of collecting, you know, some kind of uh, contaminants. And Chittamrath, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, Amrit, they have a tendency to absorb mercury if it is in the soil, like in there in industrial area. Or, um, uh, for example, when uh, vehicles with the leaded petrol start flying on the road, and the environment around will be contaminated with lead, you know, they will all deposit on the plantation around. So if your medicinal plant comes from that kind of an area, it is very likely to have to be contaminated. That is the reason. The old adages never envisage this kind of a situation. Now, I am coming to the close of it. Um, the scope and opportunities of this kind of an activity, that the efforts to implement standards have added value to the Ayurvedic system as a whole. This is something that, because number one, or people like us, we know what Ayurveda is. We have been living within that. But the large population, live alone other countries, large populations in this country. Uh, I don't know whether you are aware of the data. There are two data which I can quote you. 
One is 2017 National Sample Survey data, which said that whether it is in the urban locations of India or even the rural locations of India, it is not more than 10% of the population who resort to any one of the Indian systems of medicine for their primary health care. This was a shock to many people, but that's a fact of life. 90% of people, they rely on modern medicine, whether in the villages or in the city. This is the national data which was published in 2017, National Sample Survey of India. In Kerala, where we boast that uh, we are a second house for Ayurveda, etc., etc., here, the percent or less, anyway, that apart. So, by having this kind of modern scientific parameters and standard operating practices, they bring in universalization and normalization effects. They also help in validating the Ayurvedic practices. Somebody may ask whether there is a need for validating. Yes, it may be required in this kind of a global village where we are living, and they will help definitely in globalization. And uh, there are certain challenges. I will just run through it this time if you are able to hear me. The standards are mostly some physical para chemical parameters. This is something that I want to tell you. All the product parameters which I was referring are some physical chemical parameters. They don't talk anything about the bioactivity per se, unlike in the case of a modern medicine. When crossing manufacturer claim that a crossing tablet has 50% of paracetamol, Paracetamol is a chemical entity which can be tested in any laboratory. And if you know it is the 500% is present, then you know the pharmacology. But that is not the case with Ayurveda. Each formula has anything between 10, 15, 20 herbal formulation, herbal ingredients. Each one of them has many major molecules and many minor molecules. We do not know which particular one of them is responsible for the efficacy. Unless we know that we have no way of quantifying, in that kind of a scenario, just having some physical chemical parameter is only a starting point. It's not bad, but it is not the end. Each formulation has an average of 20, as I said, and the relative rules are not yet not the, the role of the molecules. And to add complexity, there are many regional traditions and interpretations for the classical specifications. Just yesterday only I was talking to Dr. Guru Prasad of Manipal Academy, Shankapushvi. We are talking about different entities of Shankapushvi. Somebody, the botanical name makes it, and each region has its own traditions. And appropriate technology is yet to be evolved. See, we are depending on certain technology which we have taken lock, stock, and barrel from modern pharma. There is no uh, pharma manufacturer who is ready to design and fabricate technology exclusively, specifically, particularly for Ayurveda. So in conclusion, what I would like to say is that the Ayurvedic pharmaceutical sector is in a state of flux. Its roots are still steeped in tradition when you are talking about the classical segment, even on the modern aspects of Ayurveda. And the good thing is that it allows itself to be upgraded and modernized both in its processes because now we are able to use modern technology for preparing classical formulations. And we are also able to present them in modern presentation forms as tablets, grills, granules, etc. And this happens both in its processes and product. And it's a multidisciplinary sector. Ayurveda is the prime major primary component, but there are many other streams of knowledge which come into play. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think I have come to my close. Thank you very much for patience. I'm sorry if I have not been able to uh, present what you expected me to do that, but this is what I could do that. Within Sir, thank you so much for a wonderful session because initially we had some network issues so there was a delay from our part also to start the session so I, so that's why there was an interruption in between anyway thank you so much for the uh, uh, thank you so much for the session, sir. I think that in between that it was got interrupted and uh, it's like a, it was a lot of information, very short stipulated time. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And over to you, Principal, sir. I want this, sir, also to, to speak a few words regarding the session. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Dr. Murali Dharam, sir. Despite your busy schedule, you joined us, you enlightened us. Always uh, in online platform, we have lots of uh, technical issues, but still we could get very good information from your side. I'm very happy for that. We are grateful to you. Uh, we are hoping to hear more from you probably in future sessions. Uh, I hope uh, we can conclude our first session with this. Okay, sure. Thank you Thank so you much. Sir. Please uh, continue with us. Dr. Divya will be checking up second session. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sachandaran and Dr. Divya. It was a pleasure for me to be able to talk to you and see you. And uh, uh, I'm not very sure whether I have been able to 
uh, rise to the level of your expectation but then this is within my limit this is all what i could do and i will only be uh, be happy to attempt to respond to any comments or any remarks or any queries that somebody may have they can now there is not much time it appears anybody can uh, send it through an email or whatever it is sure, and i am sure. i am very thankful to all of you for giving me this opportunity to be able to talk to you thank you thank you so much